All right, welcome back everybody to our next uh, chemistry lesson. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, different types of bonds and this is something that you already know a little bit about. Um, you already know about the two sort of main types of bonds we talk about which are ionic and covalent bonds um, but it turns out that um, we've actually been kind of glossing over the fact that in reality there's a there's a third type of bond that sits sort of in between those two extremes. So um, first question to think about is what really causes a chemical bond? Like what causes two atoms to decide that they're going to kind of um, they're going to stay fixed to each other. The thing to recognize is when we've got two atoms, like you can see here on the side here, it looks like I've got two hydrogen atoms. The nucleus is positively charged and it's surrounded by that electron cloud around the outside, which is negatively charged. As two atoms approach each other, the electron clouds are going to exert repulsive forces on each other. And so the clouds on the outside of the atoms are going to push each other apart. But if they're moving fast enough, they'll actually be able to approach um, closer. They'll be able to sort of overcome that repulsion and get close enough to where all of a sudden now the, pro uh, the uh, protons located in the nucleus are able to attract to the electron clouds. And if the nuclei of the two atoms are able to attract the other opposite electron clouds, and then we might form a bond. So each nucleus begins to attract the approaching electron clouds. And if the attractive forces between the atoms are greater than the repulsive forces, then a chemical bond forms. And so this doesn't always happen. Atoms are bouncing around all the time. And lots of times they don't have enough energy. They get close, but they just sort of bounce off each other and go on their way. We don't form a bond. But if they're moving fast enough, if there's enough energy there, then they, they can actually form that bond. Now, there, as I mentioned, there are different types of bonds. And the type of bond that's going to be formed in every case is going to depend on the electronegativities. Electronegativities of the atoms that are doing the bonding. Now we talked briefly about electronegativity when we looked at um, periodic trends. Um, so a reminder, electronegativity is basically the tendency of an atom to attract bonding electron pairs. If you want to be a little bit less precise about it, you could just say, frankly, it's it's how greedy the atoms are. It's how much they're going to pull the electrons towards themselves. And as it turns out, different atoms have different affinities or different levels of greediness when it comes to um, each other's electrons. So what I want you to realize is that you know we've been talking about you've been talking about ionic and covalent bonds for years. But what this actually is, what we never really mentioned is this is really a continuum. So really, we talked about it as being you're either ionic or covalent and that's it. And the reality is, is really it's like a scale and you're going to sit somewhere on that um, somewhere on that continuum. You might be over here on the left in an ionic bond. You might be way over on the right in a covalent bond. Or as it turns out, you might be somewhere in the middle. So um, ionic bonds, um, you'll remember, are, are, are basically what happens when the electronegativity differences between the two atoms is large. In particular, we can put a number on it, so there's a way to measure, like a relative scale for electronegativities. And so if it is greater than 1.6 on that electronegativity scale, then you're gonna form an ionic bond. And so these typically occur between a metal and a non-metal. So um, <clears throat> you'll remember that with ionic bonds, what we say is, well, the non-metal really wants electrons, and the metal is okay to get rid of those electrons. So the non-metal basically rips the electron completely away. And that's basically true if the difference in their electronegativities is 1.6 or greater than 1.6, I should say. So basically, if the non-metal really wants the electrons and the metal is sort of not bothered, then the non-metal might be able to basically completely pull it away, rip it away. So um, as a comparison, what we could say is like if we have calcium, and I'm just gonna draw, I'm just gonna draw the valence electrons just to simplify things a little bit. If I've got calcium and it's got two valence electrons, and I've got bromine, and bromine is gonna have seven valence electrons, and I have two of them, then basically bromine is gonna want these electrons so badly that it's gonna completely rip them away from calcium. And at the end of the day, then, calcium is going to end up with a plus 2 charge, and each of these bromines is going to end up with a minus 1 charge. And then they just sort of stick together because, well, positives and negatives attract. And so just like um, two ends of a mag uh, opposite magnets 
might stick together a north and south pole they'll kind of clink together and they'll, they'll form that bond and they'll be happy to stay close together because positive and negative is going to attract on the far side on the on the other side of this scale we've got covalent bonds and covalent bonds are going to happen when the difference in the electronegativities is less than right around less than 0 0.5 so what we mean to say is if the electronegativities are are really close to each other then it's going to form a covalent bond. Now, these typically occur between nonmetals. Okay, and um, we'll just see an example here. So let's look at uh, methane. And again, I'm just going to draw just the valence electrons. So carbon is going to have four valence electrons, and hydrogen is going to form is going to have just one. So each hydrogen here is just going to have one. Essentially what happens is the, the electron shells of hydrogen overlap with the carbon in such a way that they each just share those electrons with one another. Now, as it turns out, carbon and hydrogen want those electrons almost an equal amount. So they're, the carbon's pulling the electrons towards it, hydrogen's kind of pulling back with the same with the same force and so overall those um, those bonding electrons those bonding pairs stay sort of roughly in between them and they're sort of equally shared and that's what it means to have a covalent bond but if you think about these two extremes where on the ionic end the nonmetal just completely rips that electron away and on the covalent end the nonmetals say look we both want these just as much as the other one and we'll share in between those we have our, our polar covalent bonds. And so basically that's when the electronegativities is between 0 0.5 and 1.6. So like I said, it is sort of a it is a continuous scale here. And so we just sort of choose 0 0.5 to 1.6 as being the, the kind of um, the middle ground where we're talking about polar covalent bonds. Now these polar covalent bonds are still typically going to occur between nonmetals. It is chemistry, so there's always exceptions. Um, uh, but we'll see an example here. So if we have um, hydrogen and chlorine, for example. So again, I'll draw chlorine. And chlorine is going to have seven valence electrons. And then hydrogen has got its one valence electron. It is going to share with chlorine. But if we actually, I'm just going to jump over to our periodic table here. If we look at your periodic table, we can see here that um, that the electronegativity is listed on your periodic table, and it's this number in the bottom right-hand corner of the period of the um, of each element. And so chlorine has an electronegativity of three. Whereas over here, hydrogen has electronegativity of 2.1. So what that means is the, um, the electrons that hydrogen and chlorine decide to share are going to spend more time closer to the chlorine. So one way we draw that sometimes is we say, okay, well, look, it's kind of like you've got hydrogen here and you've got chlorine over here. But the electrons kind of spend a bit more time pulled over towards that chlorine. Kind of show you, look, it's, it's kind of get pulled over this way. And think about what that means. If the electrons spend more time closer to chlorine, then overall that's, this chlorine is going to be a little bit negative. And overall this hydrogen is going to be a little bit positive. Compare that to the, the case of the, ion, the um, ionic compound. When calcium lost electrons, it became positively charged. When bromine gained electrons, it became negatively charged. Chlorine doesn't completely rip those electrons away, but the electrons are spending more time next to the chlorine. So what we say is this has a partial negative charge, whereas the hydrogen here has a partial positive charge. Now this symbol right here, it's a little Greek symbol delta, and it just sort of means partial. Okay, so it's not fully negative, but it's a little bit more negative, and hydrogen's not fully positive, it's just a little bit more positive. So we're just gonna run through a few um, practice problems here um, to show you how you're gonna tell the difference between these types of bonds, be able to predict what kind of, what kind of um, molecule, what kind of uh, bond you're gonna form.
So we've got this kind of chart on the side here. This is the reminder. This is our change in electronegativity. So if the difference in electronegativity, I should say, is less than 0.5, it's covalent. If it's 0 0.5 to 1.6, we'll call it polar covalent. And if it's greater than 1.6, we'll call it ionic. So um, carbon and sulfur, I can look at my periodic table and see that carbon and sulfur is going to form um, carbon disulfide. Now the, the difference in their EN values, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at um, the two electronegativity values here. So I can see carbon is 2.5, sulfur is 2.5, and so the difference in their EN values is just 2.5 minus 2.5 is well, 0. So what kind of bond is that? Well that ends up being a covalent bond because they both want the electrons the same amount. Now this is sort of a special case where you could say that this is like purely covalent, which is to say that they really they really share completely evenly. There is no there is no overall winner whatsoever. Compare that to boron and chlorine. Now boron and chlorine, there's boron, there's chlorine. And so boron and chlorine is going to form BCl3. And the EN values, chlorine is 3, boron is 2, and so the difference is 3 minus 2. It has a difference of overall of 1.0. Well, 1.0 means it's going to be polar covalent. Now, polar just means has a pole, as in has a positive side and a negative side. So if we wanted to just make a note to ourselves, we could say, well, what's actually going to happen here is this, this chlorine is going to be slightly negative, and the boron is going to be slightly positive. Remember that the boron had the, the um, electronegativity of 2, whereas the chlorine was more electronegative at 3. Compare that to aluminum and oxygen. Uh, aluminum is right here. Oxygen is right there. And so this is going to form Al. 2O3 and um, aluminum is 1.5, oxygen is 3.5, so pretty highly electronegative, so 3.5 minus 1.5 and this gives me an overall value of 2.0. 2.0 is definitely bigger than 1.6 so this is going to be an ionic bond. And that's not a big surprise because uh, aluminum we know is a metal and oxygen a non-metal. Um, nitrogen and iodine Nitrogen, iodine, nitrogen's here. Iodine's kind of down there. And so it's going to form Ni3. The electronegativities for nitrogen is 3, for iodine is 2.5. So 0 0.5. And here's where we need to recognize that really this is like a continuous scale. So we had to pick a point and say, okay, at this point, we're going to call it polar covalent. And so 0.5 is that point. You could argue, well, it's sort of right on the border between covalent and polar covalent. And that's not really the point. The point is that it's an overall scale from one side to the other. I'm going to call this polar covalent. It's not strongly polar covalent, but it's right on that borderline where we would call it polar covalent overall. Okay, last one here. Calcium is there. Fluorine way over there. So I'm going to make calcium fluoride, which is CAF2. Um, fluorine is the most electronegative element there is at 4. Calcium is way over here at just 1. And so 4 minus 1.0 gives me a difference of 3. So this is definitely, definitely, definitely going to be ionic. That fluorine is just going to completely rip away the, um, the electron from calcium. So um, I'm just gonna we're just gonna talk really briefly here with, about one last thing that I want you to consider because um, the next thing we're gonna look at is, is why this matters. So why the type of bond is gonna dictate um, how that chemical behaves. And so I want you to consider the following. This is something you may not have thought about before, but water is really really weird uh, for a bunch of reasons. Um, and and as we know, it is the molecule of life. It's it's so super important that any life that we know of needs needs water to, to function and so one of the reasons why water is really weird is because if I if I look at this comparison right here water is a liquid at room temperature and that might not strike you as weird because it's well it's been liquid at room temperature your whole life but let's compare it to some other molecules so you can see water here is pretty light 
it's a pretty small little molecule weighing in at just 18 grams per mole. But this little tiny molecule, you'll have to get it up to 100 degrees Celsius if you want to boil it into a gas. You have to add a lot of energy to get this tiny molecule to bounce around. It doesn't like to bounce around on its own. By comparison, look at methane. Methane is almost the exact same mass as water at 16 grams per mole, and it turns into a gas at minus 162 degrees Celsius. It can't wait to form a gas. If we compare this, think of these first three entries here as a comparison. We looked at these when we talked about organic chemistry. As I get into higher and higher hydrocarbons, as the heavier and heavier alkanes, probably not a big surprise that as the alkane gets heavier, from methane to ethane to propane, as I get heavier and heavier in molar mass, the pattern is the boiling point gets higher and higher. And that should sort of make sense because if you have a bigger molecule, it's going to need more energy if it's going to fly around in a gaseous state. It's not going to be easy for it to bounce around. Now, I only included the first kind of three um, alkanes in this series here, but the same is true if you keep going. You go on to butane and pentane and so on. In fact, you have to get to pentane before you would actually find um, an alkane that would be liquid at room temperature. And pentane is way heavier than oxygen. So why is that? Why, uh, sorry, than, high, than water. Why is water going to be liquid at room temperature when it's so light it should just start bouncing all over the place and flying away as a gas? And the answer is all about the kind of bond that's formed by water. So um, water, as you probably remember, is H2O. And if I look at the electronegativities of uh, oxygen and hydrogen, oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. That is a significant difference. It's enough of a difference that this is going to form a polar molecule. And by that I mean these electrons are going to get pulled towards that oxygen more than they are towards the hydrogen. What does that mean? Well, that means that each of these hydrogens are going to have a slightly positive charge about them. Slightly positive. And each of these oxygens are going to have a slightly negative charge about them. And on its own, that's nothing particularly special, unless you consider the fact that this water molecule is not alone. It's bouncing around with a bunch of other water molecules. And so, for example, this positively charged hydrogen atom right here might want to line itself up with another oxygen from a different water molecule. And each of these oxygens and each of these water molecules are going to be slightly negative, and each of these hydrogens slightly positive. And what's going to happen? Well, between these two, this hydrogen and this oxygen, we're going to have a little interaction. That little interaction is something called a hydrogen bond. Because the hydrogen bond from the one water kind of wants to hang out with the oxygen from the other water. Because this is a little bit positive and this is a little bit negative. Now we can continue this on and on and on. We can imagine another water molecule over here that's going to kind of interact with um, the oxygen. This hydrogen is slightly positive. We're going to get another interaction here. And I'll spare you my artistic rendition of a bunch of water molecules, but imagine this carried out over uh, billions and trillions and quadrillions of water molecules. What does that mean? Well, that means all those little water molecules are going to kind of want to stick together. And then as a result of that, it means it's going to be hard to get them to turn into a gas, which means that ox uh, that water, pardon me, is going to need a lot of energy, aka it's going to have a much higher boiling point than other um, than other elements. So that's uh, than other molecules, I should say. That's just one example of how the type of bond is going to affect the properties of the molecule itself, and hydrogen bonds in particular end up being super important um, in all sorts of chemical applications as well as biology. Um, and, and on and on. So that's it for chemical bonds. Thanks.